Well, we are in a series uh, titled This Is Us. And in the This Is Us series, we've been looking at marriage and relationships and family and, and right now looking at uh, marriage in, uh, specifically and specifically a man's role in marriage. Uh, last week, we, be, we uh, uh, jumped into that, a man's role in marriage. And this week, it's a man's role in marriage part two. Guys, good on you for coming back. Uh, after last week's message and hearing the instruction, uh, just blessed to have you come back and, and uh, get uh, more of God's word about what that role is. And guys, I want to encourage you, you have the most important ministry on the face of the planet. Um, God has made you to be the leader in your home. And as the home goes, so the city goes. And as the city goes, so goes the nation. And uh, uh, your role is super important. Uh, we've been looking at a few things as we have uh, been moving along in this series. And because faith is built precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, according to the prophet Isaiah, I just wanted to kind of recap uh, as a quick flyover some of the things that we have covered in the last couple of weeks. For the sake of holding on to these things and remembering uh, these, these important truths that God is calling us to in marriage. Would to God that the marriages of the mission church were radically different from the marriages that are in this world. Would to God that our houses, our homes would be a beacon of light, a city that just shines brightly to our neighbors, to our friends, and to the world around us. And so as we have looked at these things, we looked at the most important foundation for marriage, the most important foundation for love is the lordship of Jesus Christ. And uh, that was what we looked at a couple of weeks ago. None of these things we're going to be discussing today are going to make sense if Jesus Christ isn't the Lord of your life. And Lord of your life doesn't mean um, something obscure. It means something very practical. It means that Jesus is the boss of your life. That Jesus is the authority of your life. That you look to his word for direction, that you are actually applying the things that Jesus said and taught into our daily life. That his lordship is part of our daily actual family life, actual personal, personal life. That he was the lord of our thought life. All of it, he is lord over the whole thing. Secondly, we looked at we cannot love properly unless we have been loved properly. And we know that all of us didn't grow up in uh, the Norman Rockwell home, right? A lot of us had dysfunctional homes. And we didn't learn what, what real love should be. We didn't learn what a real husband should be, what a godly wife should be. We, these things maybe weren't modeled for us. If they were for you, praise the Lord. Uh, but uh, not all of us grew up in that kind of home. And we cannot love properly unless we've been loved properly. And the good news that we looked at is that even if we grew up in a dysfunctional home like I did, the good news is, is that we have been loved properly in Jesus Christ. We have been loved and we have been loved well in Jesus Christ. And so as we learn of Jesus and as we take on his ways and then we discover how he, how he works and, and what he does and as we read his word, uh, we begin to receive and to grow in the love of Jesus Christ for us. Which brought us to the third point that we looked at. The secret to loving well is to abide in Jesus' love. And we looked at John chapter 15, right? The, just like the tree cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the, the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine and the tree. Neither can we unless we abide in Jesus Christ. And as we abide in him, we receive his love. We get filled up on, with his love. And it's then and only then that we can then go and love others. It's been said that hurt people, do you know what they do? They hurt people. And people who are loved well, love well. 
And so we want to abide in Jesus' love. So important. And uh, then we looked at we must put on Jesus' attributes of love. Put on Jesus' attributes of love. Yeah, it's really not normal for us to love with an agape love, to love with a selfless love, to love with a serving kind of love, to love with a love that isn't dependent upon the other one loving you back and treating you properly. It's not our nature to love that way. And so we looked in our, in our text where we have been basing our series off of. We're in Colossians chapter 3. And let's pick up uh, uh, there again this week, reviewing these attributes of love that, uh, that we are to put on. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 12. If you need a Bible, the ushers will be in the aisles. Uh, there to pass them out for you. Uh, just raise your hand. They'll give you one. Um, did I say Galatians? I'm sorry. Galatians is a good book, uh, but not where we're at today. Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 12. Colossians 3, verse 12. If you're there, say amen. And follow along with me as we look at these attributes of Jesus that we're to put on. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. Yeah, again, he sets that foundation. We've looked at this now uh, a couple of times. It's so important. It's worth repeating. This is how we have a godly marriage. This is how we have a godly family. This is how we be the men and women, the husbands, the wives, the mothers, the fathers that God created us to be. We realize that we are the elect of God, called by God. We realize that we are holy because of what Jesus has done for us, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done for us, and we are his beloved. We are loved by God, and therefore he says, now put on Jesus, put on Jesus' tender mercies, and we looked at that in depth. Uh, put on kindness, put on humility, put on meekness, put on long-suffering, Bearing with one another. Yeah, there's going to be times when the ones that you love, the people around you, your neighbors, whoever, they rub you the wrong way. Don't take it so personal. Don't take it so serious. Not that big of deal. Bear with one another and forgive one another. And if anyone has a complaint against each another, yeah, that happens. Even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were also called in one body. In other words, let the peace of God rule in your hearts and realize that you're all one family. And be thankful. Be thankful. Are you thankful in your walk with the Lord? I'm so glad that Maggie chose to come up this morning and just to express her thankfulness to what Jesus has done in, their li in, in her life. Aren't you thankful for what Jesus has done? Do you take time to actually meditate on those things and to thank him for it and to begin your day going, wow, Lord, just amazing, you know? I mean, uh, thank you for a new day of life. And here's what I got before me today, Lord. I'm thankful that I can... Uh, Walk with you in these things. And Lord, today I have this meeting. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me to be a good representation of you in this meeting. Lord, thank you that I get to be your witness at work today. Be thankful. Be thankful for the things that the Lord has put into your life. Verse 16, look at this. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. God's word wants to illuminate your path. We spend time in it. We're looking at it. We're on a two-part series just on husbands. Why? Because we believe God's word has a lot to speak to us to show us how to be amazing husbands. Next week, we'll look at how to be an amazing wife, right? And why? We're going to look to God's word that is a lamp unto our feet, and it is able to uh, give us wisdom and, and we're to dwell in it richly. Here's the question. Is the word of God dwelling in you richly? Are you able 
to quote it? Are you able to know it? When you see a situation, when a problem arises, does God's word instruct you? Well, it only instructs you if you know it. There's a passage in, oh, I forget if it's in Isaiah or in Hosea, uh, uh, but it says, God speaking, he says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge? What's he referring to? He's not saying that they were unschooled, that they were uneducated, or that they had low IQs. No, what's he saying? A lack of knowledge of what? God's word. God's word. Oh, how amazing to have a key that opens a door. But if you don't have the key in your pocket, there's no way that door is going to open for you. And God's word is like that for us. When your teenager comes to you with a major problem, when your wife comes to you and it could easily escalate into something Difficult, something dangerous, something of an argument. How awesome to be able to have the word of God hidden in your heart that you might call on it and it might give you direction and guidance at that time. And this is what he says, let the, put on these attributes of Christ and then verse 16, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Yeah, that is the byproduct of doing these things. There's going to be joy in your life. There's going to be singing in your home. There's going to be dancing in your kitchen. There's going to be hugs in the living room. There's going to be joy as you sit together at the dinner table. Yeah, that's what verse 16 is all about. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There it is again, a thankful heart as you meditate on God's word as it guides you in life. Verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. We're going to look at that next week. This week, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. So interesting how God knows men, right? Guys, don't be harsh with your wife. Don't be harsh. Love your wife and don't be harsh to her. I'm, I, 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 as much as I know this verse, I still have a natural tendency to give a harsh response. Because I'm matter of fact a lot of times. And my wife is tender and I have to realize how she's made. And God says, hey, hey, Dave, 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 slow down. Love your wife and be, care be careful, beware of those harsh responses. Not going to serve you well. And so last week we looked at uh, uh, some more things in our, uh, from this uh, section here about loving your wives. We went to Ephesians and we saw that husbands are to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And what kind of love was that, guys? What kind of love? We looked at it. What kind of love did Christ love the church? What do we call it? It was a pursuing love. It was an initiating love. And we looked at that last week, right? Husbands, love your wife with a pursuing love. Go after her. Be the initiator of that love. Don't wait until she deserves it. Well, she doesn't deserve to be loved. Who cares? Jesus didn't love us that way. He loved us when we were enemies against him. When we were going out and sinning and not even caring about God, his spirit was drawing us to himself. He had died on the cross for us. He uh, did all the initiating in our relationship with him. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. You didn't love me, but I loved you. You're merely responding to my love. And we went into that in depth last week. If you didn't catch it, guys, I'd encourage you, go back, listen to it. So important. Men, listen, your first role in marriage is to love your wife with a pursuing love. It's your first role. And it's so important. Uh, don't keep score. Doesn't matter if she's doing it or not, which led us to the second point that we looked at last week. Uh, man, your husbands, your role is to lay down your life for your wife. 
Lay it down. And we looked at Adam and Eve and we saw that was God's message from the beginning, right? From the very beginning of time. What did God do to get a bride for, for, for Adam? What did he do? He put down Adam. Adam laid down his life. And from his side, God made Eve. And God resurrected Adam. And he awoke and he found a beautiful bride by his side. And we saw that it was a picture that was the gospel of Jesus all the way back in the Garden of Eden, all the way back in the beginning of time, because Jesus did the same thing, didn't he? He went to the cross. The spear was thrust in his side. He died for us, and out of his side, the blood and the water flowed, and God took a bride out of Jesus' side. And when he awoke three days later, when he rose from the grave, he found a beautiful bride without spot or blemish, all her sin taken care of. She's washed white as snow. She's radiant. She's righteous. She's uh, just amazingly stunning because she has been washed by Jesus. He found a pure and spotless bride that came from him laying down his life. And now he says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Wow. How incredible. How incredible. And so that is where we have been. And now we are going to look at the next lesson for guys in marriage, where we're going today, and here's what it is. Are you ready? We're going to learn what it means to have dominion in marriage. Dominion? What do you think of when you think of dominion? Let me hear you. Some audible answers. What do you think of dominion? What is it? Dominion, well, give me some loud answers. Authority, okay. What else? Kingship, okay. What else? Dominion in marriage. Dominion over what? Some of, I can tell by the answers we're getting, we're not quite sure exactly what this is. Some of the wives kind of like are nervous, like, oh my God. And they're like, his dominion. Is that what it is? What does it mean to have dominion in marriage? Well, let's jump back to the very first marriage where God tells us and shows us uh, what kind of dominion he's looking for. This is in Genesis 1, and we're going to pick it up in verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. Love the sound of pages turning in your Bibles. Amazing that that's becoming a rare thing in churches today. So blessed to see all of you, pens in hand, notes in hand, and studying your Bibles. Love it. Uh, verse 26, let's look what it says. And then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have, everybody say it, dominion, dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You like creeping things? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You might want to circle the word created there in verse 27. How many times do you see it? It is there three times. And that word there is not a, a normal word uh, for created. It's the word bara, which means he made out of nothing. Out of nothing, God created man and woman. Uh, he just formed them and fashioned them. There's two words in Hebrew for, for, for create. There's bara and there's a saw. A saw means to fashion, to put all the parts together. Like if you get all the parts for a transmission and you put them all together, you put the gears on the spines, you put the shifting forks on there, you put the, the, the bands and everything for the uh, tr transmission and you put it all together, you're assembling all the parts. That would be the word a saw. But the word bara means to just create out of nothing. And out of nothing, God created man. He made him from the dust of the ground, but he was created all from nothing that had been before. It was all God's doing. And look at this. Three times in verse 27, 
Uh, so God created man in his own image. Created him, male and female. He created them. Hey, let me tell you something. You did not evolve. You did not come from the ooze. You did not come from the zoo to you. You were created by God. And you have great value to him. Verse 28. Then God blessed them. That would be Adam and Eve. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And I imagine Adam said, yes, Lord. Your wish is my command. I love your commandments, Lord. They are good. I will follow all of them all the days of my life, right? Uh, yes, Lord, be fruitful and multiply. And look at this. Fill the earth and subdue it. And here God says it again. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Yeah, God made Eve, took him out of Adam's side. He raised Adam up. He turned Adam around. He said, Adam, look at her. They looked at each other. Adam goes, wow, she's amazing. Eve said, is that all I get? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. They looked at each other and they knew that they were made for each other. And God blessed them right there in the Garden of Eden. God anointed them and blessed them and poured his favor on them and blessed them and said, now be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion over everything. Wow, so awesome. And notice this about the dominion. Notice this. It doesn't say the dominion was for Adam, guys. Pay attention. Wives, take a big breath and smile. It's not Adam's dominion. Whose dominion is it? It's no, no, it's not, it's not God's dominion. Whose dominion is it? It's Adam and Eve's dominion as husband and wife. Have dominion over the earth, over everything. Look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them, plural, have dominion. So the first thing I want you to see is that this dominion is for both of them. But before we go and unpack this dominion further, I want to take a step back and I want to bring just an important point to you. Should be obvious, should be really clear. I hope you saw it. Here it is. You are incredibly significant to God. You are of significant importance to God. You are very valuable to God. You have great worth in his eyes. At the creation, uh, at the very first marriage, God gave Adam and Eve dominion, dominion over all the earth, over all the fish, over all the animals, over the cattle, over everything. Have dominion. He tells them, I want you to rule over everything I've created. I want you to have dominion on the, on the earth. I want you to subdue it. The earth is yours. And here's what's happening. He's saying, hey, look, everything I created, Adam and Eve, I created for you. And you, I created for me. Wow. Do you realize that God gave the title deed to the earth to Adam and Eve? He said, it's yours. And unfortunately, they rebelled against God, and there's a whole another study we can do on that, and there's a reason the world is such a mess today. Uh, they us uh, Satan usurped that authority and that title deed. Uh, but the good news is, is Jesus brings it back, man. Jesus, in Revelation chapter 5, Jesus brings back that authority to himself as our kinsman redeemer. Uh, but that's a different study. But here's what I want us to see right now. Only humans are created in the image of God. The animals were not created in the image of God. The birds, the, 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 the fish, nothing else. Only humans are created in the image of God. You are unique in all of God's creation. And in God's creation, there is an ascending order that is happening on each of the days of creation. There is a, uh, an ascending order of significance with human life as the final act, as the pinnacle act of God's creation. And therefore, as the pinnacle act, it is the most important thing to God. 
How many of you have ever been to a fireworks show? I love fireworks. I mean, I, I watch them every 4th of July, and I make sure I get to a good spot where I can watch, because, and I like being there in person. I mean, don't watch fireworks on TV. I mean, <laughs> life's too short, man. Get out, right? And get in that, and isn't it amazing when they blow up right over you? Like, I've got a secret spot, but if I told you, everybody would be there next year. And, but at the end of the fireworks show, what happens at the end of the fireworks show? The grand finale. And what is that? That's when they just give the whole enchilada, right? It's just like kaboom. And there's more money spent in the grand finale than all the other times. Do you know what you are in God's creation? You are God's grand finale. You are his culminating work. You are the reason he created the earth. The earth is just the playing field where God could have you and him in relationship. Now what I want you to see this morning is your significant worth to Jesus. Lorenzo, put that other slide back on there, please. You are of significant importance to God. I love that, man. I just love that. Day one of creation, God created the space and the earth and the light. He said, light be and light was. <clears throat> All good, it's good. Day two, he created the atmosphere. Amazing. You know, Earth has a clear atmosphere, by the way. Most of the planets do not have a clear atmosphere. Do you know why Earth has a clear atmosphere? So that you can see the glory of God's creation. God specifically created this planet so that the universe could be observed. Most planets are not created that way. Only earth. How incredible. What a chance, right? And that was day two, and God said it was good. On day three, God caused dry land to come up out of the water. And he said, oh, it was good. On day four, he set the planets and the moons in order so that we could have the seasons that we have. And I so love this season. Don't you spring? Uh, my next-door neighbor's tree in my front yard, it's one of those, uh, I, I wish I knew the names of botany, but, but I don't. Anyway, it's one of these trees that's got those spine balls on it I've probably talked about. I love looking at this tree. And right now, it's just completely dead, right? It's like there's not a green leaf on it. But I was out walking yesterday morning, and I looked up, and I started staring at this tree. And you know what I saw? Just tons of little green buds about this big. If you look at it, it still looks dead until you look close. And there's just tons of green leaves just starting to come to life. Spring, the seasons. Yeah, God did that on day four. He put the seasons in order. The sun, the moon, the planets, and everything to bring the seasons. And then on day five, God made all the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And then on day six, what did God do on day six? God made the animals, and then after the, that, he makes man. Man. Wow. And God says, I'm done. That was what I wanted to create. And he gave the earth and everything he created to man, but he said, man, you are for me, and you are of significant importance to God. That was day six. How many days of creation are there? Seven. What happened on the seventh day? Rest. Rest. And check this out, Christian. Know how God feels about you. If man was made on the sixth day, then the day of rest was man's first day, and the first thing God wanted man to do was rest with him. Wow. Man's first day, God's seventh day of creation, a time to rest with God something we're still doing today, the first day of the week, we put God first. This is how important you are to God. God says, hey, 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 before you get busy, before you get started, I just want time with you. You are of significant importance to God. Of all the creative acts described in Genesis, the creation of man is the only one described as being preceded with a divine deliberation. A divine deliberation, what is that? Yeah, look at verse 26. Look at it with me again, verse 26. 
Then God, the word God there in Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim, I'm not giving a Hebrew lesson for no reason. What is, what is, what is Elohim? Do you know what Elohim is? Elohim is the plural for El, and El is God. Plural? Are there more than one God? Is, there, is, is my English very good? Uh, is there more than one God? No, no, no. Only one God, but this God has a triune nature. He is a father. Say it with me. He is a father, son, and Holy Spirit. The three are one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here the Trinity, Trinity being revealed in the very first pages of the Bible. Then Elohim said, let us make man in our image. Who was he speaking to? He wasn't speaking to the angels because it says, then in the image of God he created them, both male and female he created. There was a divine uh, conference in the creation of man. Uh, a divine deliberation saying, let us make man in our image. How powerful. How powerful. I want you to know the Bible speaks of man being created by God the Father, by Jesus, and by the Holy Spirit. I've got three verses to show you real quick. The first one is in Genesis 1.27. Look at this verse. Just read it with me. It's very clear. Read it. God created man in his own image. Yeah, there's, there it is, right? Clear, clear, clear as day. The Bible also uh, uh, talks about Jesus' role in creation. Colossians 1.16. On your screens. Let me hear you read this. By him, that's Jesus, all things were created. Well, who created us? Was it God or was it Jesus? Which one? Yes, both, right? They were all involved in the creation of man. And then in the book of Job, look what it says. Read, let me hear you read this. This is Job 33, 4. Read out loud together. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The word breath and spirit in Hebrew are the exact same word. By, interestingly enough, by the way, in Greek, the word breath and spirit in Greek are also the exact same word. And here, there's really no distinction. The Spirit of God has made me, and the Spirit of the Almighty gives me life. Well, who made God according, excuse me, who made man according to that verse? The Holy Spirit. And all three were very involved in your creation. The Bible doesn't describe the Godhead deliberating uh, together that way for other creation but when it comes to man it says there was a divine deliberation that happened let us make man in our image image and the father the son and the holy spirit considered this this journey that they were about to undertake of creating man knowing that man would fall knowing that man would rebel and knowing that there would be a tremendous cost by the son God the Son coming down, becoming a human, not just for 33 years, but becoming a human for the rest of eternity in order to redeem man. And the three of them said together, let's create man. Wow. Isn't that amazing? You are so important to God that even though all the sin and wickedness that is in the earth has brought such rebellion against God, he endured all of it for the hope and for the joy of your redemption. Just amazing. This dominion that we're talking about. God commanded both Adam and Eve as husband and wife to have dominion over all things. To rule over everything that God created for them. God tells them, fill the earth, subdue it. Subdue it means govern over it. Uh, govern over it. Have dominion over everything that God gives them. Do you know what this is a picture of? This is a picture of Adam and Eve as the king and the queen on earth. The king and the queen that God made one in marriage. The king and the queen that were one flesh together, working together to have dominion over all of the earth. And this isn't man's dominion. This is Adam and Eve together as one flesh being in dominion together. And this was and is God's purpose in marriage. That a husband and wife would have dominion. 
triumphing over your environment. Not being governed by it, but triumphing over it. Not being governed by the world, but actually being the governor of your world. Not being controlled by your environment, but actually being the steward of your environment. This is God's will for husband and wives, both then and now. Jesus said it this way, right? Be in the world, but not what? Of the world. In other words, yeah, the, you be a, you live in the world, but don't let the world control you. You are called to have what? Dominion over all of it. So important we, we understand it. Reproduce, increase, reign in victory over life. Hey, there may be hardship. There may be troubles. Uh, there may be storms that come in life. There may be family issues. There may be pestilence. But through it all, I want you to have dominion as you walk in fellowship with me, God speaking. I will be your God. You will be my people. And I will deliver you out of all of it. And you will have dominion over everything that you face. That's God's will for your marriage. How are you doing? Do you have dominion in your marriage? Hey, know this. That's God's standard. It's a command. It's not a request. He doesn't say, hey, if you feel like it, have dominion. What does he say? Hey, listen, Adam and Eve. Listen to me. First marriage, pattern of all marriages, I command you, have dominion. Don't let your world have dominion over you. Second point I want to bring out in today's message. Number one, uh, have dominion. Number two, this is where it gets specifically for men. Men, it is the husband's responsibility to protect the dominion that God has given to you and your wife. It's your responsibility to protect that dominion. Protect? Why protect? Well, here's why. Satan would love to destroy both you and your wife and the dominion that you are called to have. He would love to have the world ruling over you instead of you ruling over the world because you have been given a stewardship. You have been called to, uh, to reveal the glory of God and Satan would love to crush that glory, to hide that glory so that your lives weren't being lived to the glory of God and dominion but they were being just a, a, a picture of something perverse and struggling. Something different than what God created it to be. You were called to have dominion. And guys, I want to give you four steps. I kind of want to uh, wrap up with this. Uh, God has given you four steps as a husband, four steps that a husband must take to protect the dominion that God has given to you and your wife. And the first one is simply this. Put to death sinful and addictive behaviors. Put to death sinful and addictive behaviors that will diminish that dominion that God wants you to have. Put to death the sinful and addictive behaviors. In other words, take sin seriously because it causes bondage in your life. It brings bondage. You are meant to be free in Jesus Christ. You are not meant to be bound by sin. And when we give in to sin, sin begins to take hold of our life. If we give in to materialism and greed, we become in bondage to debt. If we get it, give in to uh, just getting buzzed, just escaping problems through alcohol, through drugs, through, through marijuana, through whatever, through uh, whatever drugs you might want to take, here's the problem. It causes addictions. If we're seeking performance and greatness uh, and we're just like trying to climb the corporate ladder and I need to make a name for myself and it becomes the compelling thing. Here's the problem. We become slaves to performance. And you're trying to get your value and your worth from the wrong things. Hey, you are valuable just because God created you. You are the icon of his eye. You are the apple of his eye. You are significant because of his great love for you. You don't have to do anything to be significant. You just have to abide in him. You are valuable. Hey, be careful about where you're trying to get your worth, guys, because the enemy would love to allow sin to come into our lives where we're getting our value because I'm a CEO or because I'm a top producer or because I'm the guru of real estate or because I own... Hey, careful. 
It happens in life and it happens in religion, striving to earn your worth or your performance. Don't let it happen to you. Don't let it happen to you. Put to death those sinful, addictive behaviors. You are free in Jesus Christ. And we have to make sure that we put away the things that will cause us to be bound in sin. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 8. Look at this on your screens. Read with me out loud, church. Most assuredly, I, that's Jesus, say to you, whoever commits sin is what? Say it again out loud. Is what? A slave to sin. Hey, if, you give o- if you're given over to sin, you're going to be a slave to sin. It's going to own you. Hey, you're given over to sexual immorality? Hey, guess what? It's going to own you. You're given over to getting high? Hey, guess what? It's going to own you. You're given over to being a workaholic, to, be, to trying to make a... Hey, it's going to own you. Paul said the same thing. He said, hey, do, not, do you not know whatever you choose to obey will become your master? You can choose sin, which is a cruel master, or you can choose obedience to God, which is a great master. But whatever you choose to obey is going to be your master. Look what Jesus said. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin, but if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Guys, protect the dominion that God has given to you and your wife by not being bound by addictive sinful behaviors. They will destroy the dominion God wants to give you. Sexual immorality will destroy the dominion God wants to give you. I read a statistic recently that broke my heart. Do you know what it said? It said 68% of Christian men are viewing pornography regularly. Do you not know that whatever you choose to obey is going to master you? You will not live in dominion. Do you want want to know what goes with that statistic? Imagine that, 68%. That means if I got 10 guys up here, math majors, how many guys up here, 10 guys come up front right now, how many of them would be viewing pornography? Christian men? Seven. Seven. Wow. Wow. Staggering. Staggering. Here's the next staggering statistic. Oh, well, so what? It's just pornography. It doesn't hurt anybody. Oh, it hurts people. You know what the next stat is? Men, Christian men who view pornography are 300% more likely to have infidelities in their marriage. Do you not know that whatever you choose to obey is going to be your master? What happens to the dominion God wants you to have when that gets a hook in you? You lose dominion. And we need to take these things seriously. Hey, beware, beware of how the enemy works and how subtle he is. Oh, how amazing when a man is set apart to God, when he says, Lord, I want to walk with you. Hey, we all stand, we, we all stumble. I'm not talking about being perfect. No, none of us are perfect, but here's what we do. We don't allow sin to have dominion over us. The moment we sin, what do we do? We confess it, we repent, we get washed, we get cleansed, and we start our day brand new, and sin has no dominion over us. We don't allow it to get a foothold in our life. So important, that's what we, that, that we hold on that way. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at what Paul says. Galatians chapter 5. Read this with me, men of the church, just the men only. Read out loud with me. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Hey, Jesus has made you free. Yeah, it is for freedom. Hey, don't get bound again by a yoke of slavery. Yoke, the yoke of slavery? What's that? Well, I just got to have a drink. I just got to have a drink. I just got to get high. I just got to work harder to get this next deal because I'm this next deal. The next deal gets this office, and the guy who gets this, once I get that off, hey, you'll never be there. It'll always be, there's always another rung in the ladder. Sexual sin gets its hooks in you. Hey, listen, young adults, listen. Be careful what you do with your sexual desires because they will set a pattern for your life. I talk with young guys and they say, well, yeah, I'm looking at pornography now or, or yeah, I'm doing something sexually immoral, but when I get married, then all that will change. Hey, you know what? Nothing will change. The same person who walks down the aisle when you get married is the same person that walks this way. No fairy dust is is sprinkled on you when you get married, right? And if you look at porn before you get married, guess what you're going to do when you get married? 
It's not going to go away. And here, uh, the Bible just says, hey, look, you've been set free in Christ. Stand firm them in that freedom and don't get entangled again with the flesh. So important. So important. Guys, it is important. It is your role. It is the husband's role to put to death sinful, addictive behaviors. Why? So he might protect the dominion that God has given a husband and wife in marriage. Super important. Number two. Husbands, take responsibility for your family's physical and spiritual well-being. It's your responsibility to take care of your family's physical and spiritual well-being. You say, well, where do you get that idea? Where does that come from? Well, it comes from Ephesians chapter 5. It's on your screens, verse 23. Look at this. Read it with me, men, just the men of the church. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. The head? What does that mean? Does that mean he's the boss? He gets to do whatever he wants. He gets to tell everybody what to do. No, 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 no. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. No, no, no. It means that he's the head. He is the boss. He is the authority. But just as Christ was the head and the authority, and being the head and the authority, Christ chose to be what? What does the verse say? The Savior. He's the one who lays down his life to bring the well-being of the bride. So it's so important that we hold on to this. Uh, I have a quote by Mark Driscoll that I thought really summed up what it means for the husband to be the head of the, of the family. Uh, let me read this for you. This is Mark Driscoll out of his book, Real Marriage. Uh, when the Bible says the husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church, it means that he lovingly, humbly, and sacrificially leads by being a blessing and by taking responsibility not only for himself, but also for others, beginning with his wife. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? We will post that on our Instagram this week so you can have that there. Uh, that's what it means to be the head of the, of, the, of, the, of the family. It means to sacrificially lead by being a blessing and by taking responsibility not only for himself but for others and for the whole church. Excuse me, and for, and for starting with his wife. Uh, so important. Be in tune with your family, men. Be in tune with their physical development, with their emotional development, with their spiritual development. Know where they are at. Study your Bible to know God's will. Learn how Jesus loves so you can walk in that love. Learn what it means to put on Christ. Talk to your wife and talk to your kids about what you're learning about Jesus' love. Guys, let me ask you this. Are you being the spiritual head of your family? When was the last time you pulled your kids aside and laid your hands on them and prayed for them out loud individually? Oh, I hope it's happening all the time. Hey, Sarah, you're going to school today. I just want you to know, and I'm going to pray over you right now. Lord, help Sarah to understand that she is fearfully and wonderfully made that she is beautiful because she is your daughter. And Lord, help her not to be like the rest of the world that gets their value from how sexy they think they are, from the wrong things, but Lord, help her to get her value from her worth in your eyes. And Lord, today, send her out. As she, hey, do you know how far that's gonna go in your child's life? Hey, you are the head of this family. It is your responsibility Take responsibility for your family's physical and spiritual well-being. It is God's will. Hey, when Adam and Eve sinned, when Eve sinned, who did God come looking for? Adam. Adam, what happened? Well, that shows that Ephesians 5.23 was already in place long before Ephesians 5.23, that, that Adam was the head of, the, of that family, and it was his responsibility. And may we not be like Adam, who abdicated his responsibility of Eve, who wasn't protecting her, 
who was not leading her, who did not know where she was struggling and what she was thinking, what was going on in her heart, who instead of leading her was following her, standing by her side as she starts to walk into the perverse. Oh man, may we not be like that. Do you know how your wife is doing in her walk with Jesus? Do you know how your kids are doing in your walk with Jesus? How is your family doing in obeying the Great Commission? Do you even know what the Great Commission is? You've been commissioned to it, and it's your responsibility to make sure that your family is living that out. Is your wife making disciples? Are your children learning what that means, that they're to be disciple makers? They're capable They're capable. Are you doing it? Because guys, if you're not doing it, guess what? There's no way they're going to do it. But if you're doing it, guess what? They'll want to be, they'll do it. They'll be just like you. And they'll grow up and they'll do it. 